Hello, and welcome to the Inflation Reduction Act listening session. My name is Sherry McCarter, and I'll be one of the facilitators today as we go through our session. Now I'll turn it over to Jackie Ponte Lazaric, RD's Chief Innovation Officer, to get us started. Jackie? Thanks, Sherry, and welcome, and thank you, everyone, for joining today's listening session, and welcome back to those of you who might have joined us in uh, the first of three listening sessions yesterday on other provisions under um, the Inflation Reduction Act. We'd like to take a minute to recognize our federal partners representing uh, the Executive Office of the President, the White House Chief of Staff, the Department of Energy, the Environmental Protection Agency, the U.S. Geological Survey, Small Business Administration, the Office of Management and Budget, our Senate Ag Committees, uh, Tennessee Valley Authority, federal and state elected officials and state agencies who are supporting us by attending today's session. This is the second of three listening sessions we are conducting, and uh, this one is aimed at cooperatives and um, Section 22004 uh, of uh, the Inflation Reduction Act. The goal of these meetings is to provide an opportunity for stakeholders and other interested parties to offer their feedback and input to further assist the rural utility service in implementing IRA uh, and designing products that benefit all of rural America. Your feedback will be analyzed along with comments submitted through the Federal Register comment process to assist the rural utility service in implementing the Inflation Reduction mm -hmm. Act. We understand that this is an important topic to all of you and to us, and we want to hear from you about it. While we may not have enough time to highlight all of your feedback today, please know that you may leave your remarks in the chat, and they will be included in data discovery. Now let's talk about our agenda for today. Uh, we'll have some welcoming remarks from RD leadership and our U.S. leadership, and then we'll have a brief overview of the Inflation Reduction Act and a specific focus on the cooperative provision. Then we'll have an opportunity uh, for you all to share with us your thoughts in our listening session portion of today's uh, event. And then there'll be a call to action with a few items for you to think about as you leave this session and a wrap up. Um, and uh, uh, and then we'll, we will uh, end the session. Uh, we wouldn't be government if we didn't have lots and lots of acronyms. And so today we are um, putting on the screen some acronyms you might hear today. I've already used one of them today, which is IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, the Rural Utilities Service, you'll hear us call it the RUS. And of course, rural development is RD. If there are other acronyms that we use and you're not sure of what they are, just pop a question in the chat. We're happy to, um, to let you know what those acronyms mean. We hope you enjoy today's session and we find it productive. And with that, I will hand it over to Rural Development Deputy Undersecretary Farah Ahmad. Farah? Thank you so much, Jackie. Um, it is a pleasure to be here. Thank you to all of you for joining today's listening session. Uh, we are just so incredibly excited um, for uh, the provision that we're speaking to you about today. So as Jackie mentioned, um, this is part of the Inflation Reduction Act, or a historic legislative package that President Biden signed into law on August 16th, uh, earlier this year. And, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act, it really represents the largest single investment in rural electrification since the passage of the Rural Electrification Act in 1936. And we don't take that lightly. This is an important opportunity uh, for rural communities, uh, for cooperatives to really be part of um, this historic legislation to build long-term resiliency, reliability, and affordability of rural electric systems. Um, and to really achieve the greatest reduction in carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide emissions that we've ever seen. And I'm actually coming to you today from Iowa. Uh, I've been on the road uh, the last couple of days. I was in Wisconsin. Uh, yesterday, um, speaking with rural economic developers, producers, um, small businesses, and entrepreneurs. And in every conversation um, that I've had over the last couple of days, it'll not come to a surprise to you, but cooperatives came up as incredibly important um, pieces of uh, partnership when it comes to economic development in rural communities. 
that cooperatives have the pulse of the community, that they truly are economic engines. And so we are incredibly grateful uh, to you all for joining today's listening session. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you uh, about how we can make uh, this historic uh, legislative package, the Inflation Reduction Act, um, be the best that it can be for rural America and beyond. Um, so again, just look forward to looking forward to hearing from you about your thoughts about how we can do this better together. Uh, and with that, I'd actually like to introduce uh, someone who's going to be incredibly important uh, as we get the Inflation Reduction Act off the ground, uh, the Rural Utilities Service Administrator, Andy Burke. And he's going to give an overview of the Inflation Reduction Act with a special emphasis on section 2204, which is the provision for cooperatives. So with that, Andy, I will hand it to you. Thanks so much, Farah. I appreciate it and uh, hope all is well in, in Iowa uh, for you. So um, appreciate everybody being here today and uh, for joining us. So the Inflation Reduction Act is one of the most transformative pieces of legislation uh, that we have seen in our lifetime because it is the largest investment in clean energy in our history. President Biden has led us forward to this great moment and now Secretary Vilsack is determined to make sure that we implement this efficiently and effectively. So I come from Tennessee and as Farah noted, almost 100 years ago, uh, President Roosevelt started uh, us down this road with the Rural Electrification Act, but also with the beginnings of the Tennessee Valley Authority. And that played such a critical role in the history of my region, not just because of the infrastructure, but because of what we were able to do with the infrastructure. Reliable, affordable, um, stable power allowed our region to grow its quality of life and to prepare itself for economic development. And this changed our future. Now today, once again, we are talking about cheap, stable, reliable power and this transformation to clean energy, particularly from the cooperative side. And this, once again, will assist rural America to grow for the future. Now, um, as we sit here today, uh, we are looking for your feedback on these tremendously important provisions because for us to make this work, and we are going to make this work, we need your input today and also your partnership tomorrow. This is an incredibly transformative moment. We have an amazing opportunity. And with that, I wanna turn it over to our assistant administrator for electric programs, Chris McLean. Chris? Thank you, Mr. Administrator. And uh, thank you uh, all of our guests. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be able to brief you today on the uh, quick overview of the statute itself. So we'll go. And uh, as Jackie had mentioned, there's two key provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act targeted at the Rural Utility Service. Uh, yesterday, uh, we had a wonderful listening session focusing on 22001, which is a partially forgivable uh, loan program under Section 317 of the Rural Electrification Act. But today, our exclusive focus will be on 22004, where the uh, Congress administration um, approved $9.7 billion of budget authority for long-term resiliency, reliability, affordability of rural electric systems to achieve the greatest reduction in carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide emissions. Now, Congress defined eligibility uh, to be uh, rural electric cooperatives that are or have been RUS borrowers uh, or are themselves rural, again, rural electric cooperatives are serving predominantly rural area or are wholly or jointly owned subsidiaries of such cooperatives. The statute created uh, several project products for us to uh, uh, opportunities to offer financing uh, to uh, program participants. Those include loans, the modification of loans, in other words, the changing of existing loans that uh, RUS uh, has on its books, the cost of loans and loan modifications. In other words, the budget authority can be used to uh, finance those changes. 
grants, uh, or other financial assistance. Those uh, forms of financial assistance can be uh, used for the following activities, uh, to purchase renewable energy, uh, to, re to deploy renewable energy systems, to deploy zero emission systems, uh, to deploy carbon capture and storage systems as well as making energy efficiency improvements to generation and transmission systems of eligible entities. There are a couple of uh, significant limitations to be aware of um, as you consider participation in the program. Number one, no eligible entity may receive an amount equal to more than 10% of the total amount made available under this subsection. In other words, 10% uh, of that $9.7 billion we just mentioned. And uh, if a grant is to be offered, uh, grants should under this subsection shall not exceed 25% of total project costs. So they'll uh, have to be at least uh, a 75% um, non-grant component to projects finance. Now, th these direct uh, provisions for uh, direct assistance from the Rural Utility Service are in addition to uh, several extraordinary uh, provisions um, under the tax uh, code uh, that are under the control of the Department of Treasury. So there's a host of clean energy tax incentives for developers, for consumer-based energy efficiency, for electric vehicle purchases, for charging stations, and for carbon capture sequestration. And most notably, the Inflation Reduction Act provides a direct pay tax incentive specifically for co-ops, as well as other nonprofit and municipal entities. Uh, the Inve Inflation Reduction Act also uh, funds uh, green banks. Now, the RUS is not in a position to, um, uh, to speak for the Department of Treasury, but I will observe as a matter of, uh, of a factual statement uh, when uh, other entities have uh, been able to take advantage of tax credits uh, in, uh, under the uh, investment tax credits or production tax credits. Uh, that has never been, uh, that had not been a previously an impediment for RUS to provide um, financing as well. Here's another very critical item for you to remember as you uh, plan to uh, offer us your advice here and um, answer some of our polling questions but uh, also as you start planning projects that you might want to uh, bring forward under this um, exciting uh, historic uh, provision. Because the IRA was uh, adopted under a legislative procedure called reconciliation, which is a uh, privileged, uh, privileged motion in the, uh, a privileged piece of legislation in the United States Senate that is used to implement uh, the directives of the congressional budget, uh, the IRA is limited in its lifespan um, for no more than 10 years. And because the appropriations bill or the IRA passed late in the uh, fiscal year, uh, almost a year of that time has elapsed. So funds have to be divert, dispersed under the IRA. Um, no later than September 30th, 2031. In other words, prod, the, the program has to be set up. Uh, applications have to be received. They have to be uh, underwritten and reviewed and ranked uh, and awarded. Environmental review has to occur and projects have to be built all before September 30th, 2031. And for large utility infrastructure projects, we all know that that will come and go in the wink of an eye. So RUS has adopted uh, uh, watchwords of trying to keep speed, simplicity, and familiarity in mind as we work uh, together to craft uh, a successful program. So now this is, this is your chance. Your input is absolutely uh, critical to uh, our successful implementation of this extraordinary uh, set of programs that the Congress and the uh, Biden administration have given us, and we look forward to hearing to hearing your thoughts and your ideas. And I'm going to turn the uh, floor over to Sherry. Thank you, Chris. 
As Chris mentioned, this is the time where we want to listen and hear from you. And this portion of the session will be dedicated to you participating by answering a series of questions. There are a few basic guidelines to keep in mind while participating today. First, we want to hear from everyone who wishes to share. Please be mindful of this as you offer your feedback during the next 90 minutes or so. As facilitators, we will do our best to ensure all who wish to speak have an opportunity to do so. We reserve the right to step in and move the conversation forward if time is running short or if we veer too far off topic. Know that we may ask you to wrap up your remarks or place them in the chat box so they can be seen. This way we can ensure everyone has an opportunity to be heard. Please understand that our intention is not to stifle conversation or make anyone feel as though they can't share. Our intent is to foster an equitable conversation that lifts all perspectives. Second, if you wish to speak, please raise your hand and our host will unmute you. If during the conversation you aren't comfortable re replying verbally, please type your answer into the chat box. Finally, as a reminder for those of you who, have, who may have joined late, this meeting is being recorded and will be made publicly available on the IRA webpage. If you are not comfortable being recorded, you may leave the meeting and provide written comments electronically at www.regulations.gov. Comments must be submitted no, late, no later than November 28th. And for your convenience, we've posted the link in the chat. Next, I'd like to introduce Lou Torres from the Innovation, Innovation Center's Customer Experience Team. Lou? Thanks, Sherry, and welcome everyone. We're really excited that you're here today. Today, I'm joined by Scott Cesarek from the Innovation Center Customer Experience Team. He's running back a house. He's our, our tech support today. And we have Sherry McCarter, you heard from. And we have Maggie Wil Wilkins and Val Jensen. They're also from the Innovation Center Customer Experience Tech Team. We're all gonna be co-facilitating throughout the conversation today. We also have some member, a member from Rural Utility Service, RUS, as our subject matter expert to help us out. In respect to your time, we do want to keep today's listening session um, to our scheduled two hours. We have a lot of questions. And in order to cover everything, we ask you to participate by answering and polling questions, by responding to follow-up conversations and discussion-based questions, by either raising your hand and speaking, or putting your information in the chat box. Now, we do understand that you might have some comments you want to make that aren't necessarily aligned with a specific question. So in between some questions, we're going to be asking for those general comments. I know some people click they, they had a general comment they'd like to make. So we, we are going to address that today to make sure that everybody gets a chance, um, time allowing. So with that, let's get started. We've heard about the Inflation Reduction Act, IRA statute from Russ Assistant Administrator Chris McLean and about the work that Rotilla Russ is doing to provide the funding, the products, address provisions within the Inflation Reduction Act. Now, our leadership really, really does wanna hear from you. Um, and so our first set of questions is about program interest. Um, so what is your level of interest in funding available for rural electric cooperatives through section 22004 of the act? Is it no interest at all? Are you still exploring uncertain? Is it low interest? Is it modern interest or is it high? We'd really like to hear about that. Boy, we have a lot of high interest coming in here. 66% of our group have um, high interest to moderate interest and some people are still exploring. So um, we're really happy you're here today. Uh, we hopefully we can um, get the information out there and give you enough resources to learn about this. So. What I'd like to do real quick is to find out if there's any hands raised yet, Maggie. Yes, we have uh, several hands raised and I'll start off with Kristen Tadno. Thank you. Kristen, if you wanna come off mute. 
Thank you. I, thank you very much. I appreciate you taking my comment. I'm an elected uh, director at a rural electric cooperative in Colorado, and I also happen to be a former grant project officer at the U.S. Department of Energy, which gives me a little bit of a unique perspective. Um, I just wanted to emphasize three points. Uh, first, I know you're probably going to be awarding a lot of these competitive grants to the large GNTs, but please uh, don't forget, please consider reserving a portion for the hundreds of distribution utilities who will be fundamental to uh, accelerating beneficial electrification in our nation's cooperative service territories. Uh, to that end, um, my point number two, a lot of rural electric co-ops, as you know, don't have the staff and resources uh, to put together a very complicated grant. Having run these grant processes, I know how discouraging it can be from someone uh, who, you know, for them it may be their first time and they'll be overwhelmed um, by the competitive process. So the more that you can do to make this simple for the distribution co-ops who don't have those staff, um, either in terms of holding their hands or just putting together some very clear criteria that if you meet this, you know, you will get these dollars based on either the number of customers you serve or whatnot would be super beneficial in encouraging those distribution co-ops who would otherwise be discouraged to apply. Um, and the last point is just thank you for acting quickly on this. It's really important that you get this out the door um, and appreciate you taking the time to take our feedback. Thank you. Kristen, um, thank you for bringing that up. We actually have a question later on in our um, session that addresses that. How, how do people um, want us to address the larger versus the smaller applicants? And so um, thank you for bringing that and um, supplying your thoughts. So we're gonna go to our first discussion question. Um, and thinking about if you're um, the projects that you might have, so what projects are you considering that could meet the statutory requirements, Section 22004 of the Inflation Act, Reduction Act? So what projects are you thinking? What are you considering? Love to hear some more about that. Do we have any hands, Maggie? Yes, we have several hands raised. Uh, let's, I'm going to go to David uh, Sprodlin. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Hi there, we can hear you great, thank you. Hi, right, thank you. So my name is David Spradlin. I'm the CEO of the uh, Springer Electric Cooperative in New Mexico. And we are a member of Tri-State GNT. And so <clears throat> a couple of different uh, things that we are very interested in. Uh, certainly, yeah, Tri-State is developing projects to meet the uh, requirements of both uh, Colorado and New Mexico. So I think these under section 22004, uh, those projects should fit under those. And we were very excited for the opportunity under that section. Uh, those, those projects will benefit all the members of the four states that uh, Tri-State serves. And so this is an excellent program and we're very pleased with it. Uh, and then on a, a personal basis for my co-op, we own a one megawatt solar project that we built in 2015. And we did it through our normal work plan. And so we have a, a work plan uh, that was approved by RUS for the project. And we went through all the environmental review and we, we've built it in 2015. So we have an existing loan on that project from RUS. So I, I missed the, set, the uh, <clears throat> discussion yesterday for our prior commitments. So my question would be, would a, a project like ours fit under section 22001 under the loan forgiveness piece, or would it fit under 202004 20, 20, under the modification of an existing loan? Thanks, David. You know, I'm going to ask you if you could put that question in the chat box. And then yeah. after the session today, we're going to make sure our subject matter experts can take a look at that. And okay. we have your email. Would that be okay with you? Absolutely, that'd be awesome. Or, or, David, or David, if you could also oh. just pose it as a as a suggestion or a recommendation. Okay, yes, I can definitely do that. Thank, thank you. you, Chris, that's even better. So thank you. Um, but this is some, some great information we're hearing. 
Um, but thank you, David. Maggie, um, do we have any more hands up? Yes, we do. We could go to Dwayne Hiley. Hi there, this is Dwayne Hiley. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you, Dwayne. Excellent. Uh, so I want to thank Deputy Undersecretary Ahmad and Administrator Burke, Assistant Administrator McLean, and just all the RUS staff for the ability to be part of this session today. Um, I serve as the CEO for Tri-State Generation and Transmission. I think you heard it from uh, one of our members or actually two co-ops that represent our members already this, this afternoon. Uh, we have a total of 42 utility members we serve across the American West, and we're really excited to have a high degree of interest in this uh, Section 2204 for cooperatives like Tri-State that are making a rapid energy transition. This program is gonna help us ease the challenges of that transition while also in reinvesting in our rural communities that are so greatly challenged these days. Uh, you know that co-ops don't have the same financial tools to deal with energy transition as other aspects of our industry, and that puts a disproportionate burden on our rural Americans and our rural communities. So we really are thanking you for your strong leadership on Section 2204 and uh, your rapid action here. So as you know, Tri-State's in the middle of implementing our responsible energy plan, which is going to reduce our emissions associated with wholesale electric sales in Colorado by 80% by the end of this decade. And uh, by 2025, we'll be at 50% clean energy for all of our members across the four states in which we serve, and 70% uh, clean energy for all four of those states by 2030. So as we look at this opportunity, I wanted to share some thoughts on how we hope this program could help us maximize the benefits. You asked specifically about what kind of projects we would allow. We would encourage USDA to allow for the variety of different opportunities as a project and for those to be bucketed together. So in other words, multiple opportunities put together as a single project, which could include for Tri-State, the development of clean, clean generating resources like wind and solar, new transmission to tie those things together, including the potential for high voltage DC across the grid, uh, distributed energy resources from our member systems pooled together, uh, energy efficiency options, and a consideration of stranded debt. That would give us the greatest benefit and efficiencies for our members. Uh, especially the idea of stranded debt from the early retirement of coal generation facilities. That's one of the biggest challenges we face, and we don't have the same financial tools to deal with that unproductive debt as other industry participants do. So we encourage USDA to help us find ways to help cooperatives directly assess that burden that the stranded assets cause. And we also encourage USDA to provide options from the broadest possible suite of financial tools, including grants, grant and loan combinations, and loans of varying terms, to help meet the debt structure of the various program participants. Finally, we'd encourage you to give the stakeholders the ability and the flexibility to finance renewable transmission projects that have already started development or that will begin development within the next year. Again, just giving us the broadest possible way to apply these funds. So again, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. And we're really looking forward to continuing to engage with USDA as you move forward with this program. Thank you, Dwayne. Um, I just want to thank everybody. It's just some great, thoughtful comments that we're getting today. Um, Val, do we have anything in the chat box? We sure do, Lou. Um, with regard to the question on what projects are you considering, um, we're seeing some comments on some carbon capture. Um, we're seeing one on potential upgrading switch gear and shifting to three-phase power. Uh, we're also seeing another one on um, where someone is working on a method of electrolyzing rain to be burned uh, in any modified engine. And so we're seeing some different, definitely some different projects that are being considered, which is wonderful to see. Um, we're also getting some questions in the chat about what may be eligible. And while we may not be able to answer that today, we will send them forward. Um, today, we're really wanting to hear from you as we're building out these programs to be able to use some of these IRA funds here. And so just know that while you're asking, we, we do see that and we will make sure that they get um, sent on. Um, and then the other question we're seeing or comments we're seeing are about, um, will this information be posted? And yes, just as a reminder, it is being recorded and it will be available at the um, IRA webpage. And so with that, I think I can, uh, I can send it back to you, Lou, and we can keep moving. Thank you. Maggie, how about another question from our hand raised? Yes, uh, okay. Kevin Cooney. Hello, can you hear me? 
Yes, we sure can, Ken. Thank oh, you. Yeah, great. Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, it's uh, Kevin Cooney. I'm um, an elected uh, distribution co-op uh, board member from Western Colorado, and um, and also served on the tri-state board. Um, and uh, I, I guess I want to reiterate some of the things we've already heard from uh, from Dwayne Hiley and other uh, member co-op uh, leaders uh, here, Kristen and David, um, thanking, thanking the USDA for the outreach. I think this is a very important step in the process, and it's uh, great to see it happen quickly. Um, to, to kind of emphasize a couple of points that were made, I think that uh, uh, one of the things that was said is that to assure that there's uh, things available and easy to access for distribution co-ops as well as for the GNTs. Um, uh, obviously very important um, as there are many uh, things that distribution co-ops can do to make the uh, local power more reliable and affordable and to improve resiliency given uh, the wildfire issues we have in the, in the West, we have a need to uh, sometimes do microgrids um, and other types of uh, storage projects to balance loads as we enter into more renewable energy contracts, both local and at the grid scale. Um, Dwayne uh, covered, I, I think, pretty well what's going on with Tri-State's Responsible Energy Plan um, and, you know, the coal plants that are being closed. It's uh, uh, the other section, I guess, we talked, you spoke about yesterday was uh, very important in terms of uh, stranded assets and debt forgiveness for um, both uh, the coal plants that are being um, closed ahead of their useful life. And while they still have many years of loans left on them, sometimes lo low interest loans that were financed by the federal government. Uh, and so as those plants close, there, there is a need um, for that financing to be, for some help to be provided so that the debt doesn't strangle our GNTs around the country. Um, and so I, I really wanted to emphasize that point as well as the, the strength of the direct pay in this particular section that we're talking about today to add transmission, to add energy storage, uh, so that we can bring online as quickly as possible uh, the large-scale renewables that we need to meet our climate goals that we've set as a country. And, and so that's uh, we've got ambitious targets, um, and we appreciate the USDA's role in, in helping uh, rural communities meet the challenge, and particularly the communities that are most impacted by the closure of coal plants and other facilities so that we can provide a, a smooth transition as we move forward um, in the rest of the decade here. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Kevin. There were some great suggestions there. Um, so with time now, we're gonna need to move forward for the next session, next section of our questions. But we, um, if, if you had something specific to this question, if you could put it in the chat box, we'd really super appreciate that. Um, so I'm gonna ask Sherry to take us on to talk about the application process. Sherry? Thanks, Lou. As Lou said, these next series of questions will uh, be about the application process. And we're gonna start with a polling question. Are you familiar with USDA application process? It looks like the majority of folks on the call today are not familiar with the USDA application process. It's about, it's split about 61 to 39%. So with that in mind, we're going to think about the next chat question. So we'd like for you to put your, to think about this and to put your answers in the chat or raise your hand if you'd like to speak. This question is for those of you who answered no. Please enter the type of technical assistance you think you would need in the chat box. Of course, we understand that you may not know what type of technical assistance you would need at this point, but just please let us know if you anticipate a need, even if you're not sure what it is. And then we'll see, Val, do we have any comments in the chat addressing this question? Uh, we do. Yes, Sherry, they're starting to come in. Um, we're seeing some um, comments on needing assistance with just application. Um, 
some are asking for um, screenshots of the application process and some yeah. guides on working through it. Um, resources for grant writing directly and indirectly related to loan opportunities presented today. Um, we've got some clarity on eligibility, um, the project definition and scope, ability to use multiple forms of finance. Yeah, right. we're, we're starting to see a lot of answers come in, um, pre-proposal assistance and review, um, and there are some are asking for some Q&A online resources to help. Mm. So great suggestions here that we're seeing. Thank you all for submitting them. And please, if there's something you have or ideas you have in some form of assistance, um, put it in the chat and we can definitely look at it and um, see what the need is out there. Thank you, Val. Maggie, I think we've got time for um, someone who wants to make a comment about technical assistance need. Yeah, uh, we're going to go to Terry Blayton. Terry, if you want to come off mute. I think it's Terry Blanton. Yes. Um, five days. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Thank you, Terry. So five days is not enough time to like really search out a plan for what really needs to be done. And we have worked on this for like 20 some years in Kentuckians for the Commonwealth. And I am a Bluegrass Energy uh, member and feel like that I should have more notice about what's going on and what really can happen. And I think the first thing that needs to happen is energy efficiency and helping people deal with energy efficiency. And then we move on from there. And as we've seen with the floods in Eastern Kentucky, we need more uh, local distributed energy, not only uh, dependent on coal, because uh, as I read all of your stuff, it's like two of the plants in Kentucky produce energy for um, our electrical co-ops, but um, they, you know, we never take into consideration, like, we only take into consideration, like, what comes out of the stack, but we never consider, like, what actually happens in the whole mining process and how much carbon is released. So we need to take the whole, some people call the life cycle of coal, but we need to take it take a look at the death march of coal and we did need to look at the flooding that happened in eastern Kentucky that was all around strip mines and mountaintop removal that fuels the economy in eastern Kentucky so uh, and then think about carbon capture and sequestration that's just another farce and um as a co-op member, I think that we should look at more uh, renewable energy resources and how we can invest in them. Thank you so much, Terry. That's some great comments that we have on file here, and we appreciate you taking the time to share those with us. So now we're going to move on to our next polling question. Considering application timeframes, how soon would you anticipate filing an application once IRA funding products are available? Zero to six months, six to 12, one to two years, two to three years, or three plus years? It's pretty split between zero to six months and six to 12 months. So it looks like you guys may be pretty prepared to. Um, to fill out an application pretty quickly. Yeah, we end up with um, zero to six months at 35%, six to 12 months at 34%. Then it goes down 26% from one to two years and then about 3% split between, or 3% uh, each for two to three years and three plus years. So thank you for, for those answers. And that's going to take us right into our next, we're going to have a series of polling questions. We'll go through those and then we'll give you, um, give you a chance to comment. But these, kind of, these questions kind of build on each other. 
So we're going to start with understanding the time frame for construction. How soon would you anticipate starting a project that receives IRA funding? Less than six months, six, uh, 18 to 24 months. Did I say six? Less than 18 months. I'm sorry. 18 to 24 months, two to three years, three to four years, four to five years or five plus years. Okay, it looks like 18 to 24 months is the um, is the highest group of folks. We've got about 15, uh, 51 percent at 18 to 24 months, and then we've got less than 18 months at 27 percent. So thank you. And we're going to move into the next question. Understanding the time frame for construction, how soon would you anticipate completing a project that receives IRA funding? Less than 18 months, 18 to 24, two to three years, three to four years, four to five or five plus years. Looks like two to three years is gaining some momentum. And we've got about 9% who that think about less than 18 months and that's that's impressive and then we go to 18 to 24 months at 24% and then of course 2 to 3 years is 33% 3 to 4 years it comes in at 20% and 4 to 5 years at 11% and then 5 plus years at 4% so we've gone through a series of time frames for uh, a project from applying to the project to completing a project using IRA funds. And you've done a great job with answering these polling questions. But now we'd like to hear a few comments about the this set of questions. So Maggie, do we have anyone who's raised their hand that would like to talk about this process, this Part of the application process? Yes, we're going to go to Michael Barto. Hi, Michael. Michael, if you want to, uh, there you hi, go. Uh, I hope you can hear me. I'm sorry uh, to turn on my uh, access. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, I, I really love what you guys are doing as far as getting an understanding of people's plans and all that. Uh, please keep in mind going, uh, sorry, I'm from Aaron at uh, Solutions Corporation, we're actually assisting Tri-State. So hello, everybody with Tri-State. Um, the scope of the work is going to be really what judges their time frames, the amount of technical assistance, and all that. So I, I just really want to say is that yeah, these questions are great because you're an understanding, but the USDA has to kind of take a look at how do we break it out so the low end and don't offense into the low. Um, a revenue utility versus the tri-state type of combine, uh, they have different aspects, different project lengths. Is that going to be addressed? Thank you. Yes, Michael, thank you. As um, if I understood your, your comments correctly, we're going to be talking about the equity portion of this um, process and the application process along with the um, of how to distribute the funds. So we're going to get to that in just a few minutes. And But before we move on, Maggie just wanted to see if there was uh, someone else who had their hand raised. Yes, we're going to go to Holmes Hummel. You want to come off mute, please? Hi, Holmes Hummel with Clean Energy Works. Uh, thanks to all for the representations to this point. A couple of things to contribute to the process. One is that we passed an earlier question on technical assistance where most of the assistance seemed to be focused on how to fill out the application. And uh, as somebody who's worked with rural electric co-ops for many years, uh, what I'm finding in conversation is that most co-ops even need technical assistance to figure out which types of resources or projects to develop and how to do the analysis to select which investments to undertake next. This is not a type of technical assistance that our U.S. has typically provided and sometimes has even been prevented from providing, in which case an interagency cooperation with some of those that were named at the outset of this broadcast 
might be useful in fully filling the pipeline with the diverse set of applicants that we're hearing have an interest. Uh, the second thing that I would want to note in observation and in, in making a contribution here is that zero emission systems is the only category that I can read on Assistant Administrator Christopher McLean's slide for the beginning of this broadcast that would cover the energy efficiency upgrades that have been sought by people who are making comments, both in the chat box and vocally, which means that in the implementation, USDA's determination that zero emission systems has a definition that includes distributed energy resources that are covered under the Energy Efficiency Conservation Loan Program would be essential to including them in this $9.7 billion program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Holmes. Great, great comments. Uh, you've done a, you all have done a great job, job with um, giving us suggestions and, and pointing things out that are, those things are certainly gonna be helpful as we move forward. We're gonna turn now to a discussion question. So we'd like for you to please put your answers in the chat or raise your hand and our host will unmute you. How do you recommend RUS balance the interests of large and small applicants? So we'll let you think about that for a minute. And we'll start with someone uh, hearing from someone who has their hand raised and then Val will go to you for some suggestions in the chat. Maggie? We're going to uh, go to Ryan Ellerton. All right. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Ryan Ellerton. I serve as the general manager at San Isabel Electric Association in Southern Colorado. Uh, also a member of Tri-State G&T. Uh, certainly support the projects that they have in mind. Um, thank you for, for this forum and, and for allowing me to speak. Uh, my comments are uh, largely in response, and I think it fits with this question, but largely in response to um, there's people outside of the typical USDA and RUS audiences um, with seem to have a lot of eyes on this funding, a lot of funding available. And we can see that in uh, the polling questions about familiarity with uh, the USDA application process. So I just want to encourage USDA, not just to this subsection, but um, to uh, in general to the USDA IRA funding to prioritize rural not-for-profit cooperatives and not for Profit cooperative power suppliers. Um, most of us uh, representing those those entities on today's webinar have been serving rural America back to the late 1930s. Uh, just as you mentioned at, at the opening of today's session, uh, we've consistently demonstrated that commitment to rural America. Um, so, among everyone vying for for a piece of this funding, uh, I believe that that rural cooperatives are best suited to assist our member owners. Um, directing funding to, to our industry, uh, first to address stranded asset debt uh, through loan forgiveness, and then second to build new local projects, I, I believe will best serve rural America. Uh, thank you for allowing me to make that comment. Thank you, Ryan. And I don't know if you were able to see or not, but there were a lot of uh, applause for your comments. <laughs> and they're still coming through. So thank you. Thank you for those. Val, do we have any comments in the chat regarding the best way to balance the large and small interests? Yeah, we sure do. Um, first, we have uh, one suggestion or comment that says consider two application types. Um, one is stating impact metrics and another consider a pre-qualifier to filter or categorize applications. Um, due to economies of scale, assign buckets for large versus small. In this manner, all have balanced opportunity to compete. Um, another comment stating small rural DACs should prioritize, have a larger maximum grant and lower match. Um, and some additional support for small rural electric co-ops, um, traditionally as they do not have the funds to hire grant writers or are they able to find experienced grant writers. Um, we have consider LOIs as pre-qualifiers, give scoring advantages to those less represented, represented and less populated. Um, we also had a comment on base it on the Justice 40 requirement. And so we're seeing some great comments. So please keep them coming, keep your feedback coming. And um, it's something that our leadership will definitely consider as they look to um, get some of these 
funding products designed here. Thank you, Val. Maggie, does anyone have their hand raised to offer some suggestions? Yes, we're gonna go to Chris Woolery. Thanks, I'm Chris. I am the Residential Energy Coordinator for Mountain Association. We're a CDFI uh, in Eastern Kentucky. Um, we work with um, some rural electric co-ops across Eastern Kentucky on the House Smart program. And um, it's an e inclusive utility investment program based upon the pay as you save model. I'm excited for the opportunities that the IRA will bring to expand on this important work and that can bring comfort and energy savings to folks that are usually shut out uh, from energy efficiency programs. Uh, think low income families, renters, and seniors on fixed incomes. And so I do wanna say I greatly appreciate the opportunity to submit my comments today, but like Terry Blanton said, I'm disappointed on the short notice for this listening session, which means many co-op member owners will not get that same opportunity to speak today. Uh, it takes a lot of time and hard work to engage impacted individuals and communities and the USDA's abbreviated engagement procedures around the IRA do not allow for that work to be done, nor do they align with the cooperative principles of the RECs they hope to serve, like democratic member control, members' economic participation, autonomy and independence, education, training, and information. So I want to encourage y'all to apply the Justice 40 principles as um, as being exemplified by the DOA, DOE and Dr. Tony Reams as they um, laid out in their Justice 40 kickoff webinar on August 17th. I'd also I'd like to advocate on behalf of member owners in Eastern Kentucky. I'm an aspiring member owner. Uh, when I build my forever home, I will be a member owner. And we're dealing with huge uh, rate increases, fuel adjustment cost re increases, and two devastatingly extreme flood events over the past year. So we wanna prioritize the communities with the highest carbon emissions, the highest debt loads per capita, and that we wanna prioritize uh, investments that maximize savings and benefits to member owners. Um, our communities have endured persistent poverty. We've been historically underserved. We carry some of the highest pollution and energy burdens in the nation. And so, Folks that receive, co-op member owners that receive power generated by EKPC are already paying uh, almost $30 a month per meter in debt service for outdated fossil fuel infrastructure. And so we can't afford to finance the clean energy improvements that will help us lower our bills. And so to wrap up, I just wanna say uh, thank you for acting with urgency and implementing these provisions but please extend and enhance the opportunities for stakeholders to engage in the process. Um, we'd love to have a chance to organize and mobilize the folks that couldn't be here today. And we'll try to do that through written comments. Thanks again for the opportunity. Thank you, Chris. And I'm glad you mentioned about the written comments. They, that, uh, that opportunity will be available until November the 28th. And I hope that um, through that website that others will be able, that who couldn't attend today will be able to uh, provide their comments there. And many of your, your comments today lead a great segue into our next group of questions that will be coming down the pike. And I'm going to turn the, the mic back over to Lou as she takes us through our next set of questions. Lou? Thank you, Sherry. So we're going to be talking about equitable program access. We've got some questions coming up. But first of all, just a little bit of background. So the administration has a prioritized building resilient infrastructure that can withstand the impacts of climate change that helps combat the climate crisis while investing public dollars efficiently to avoid waste and focus on measurable outcomes for the American people. Another priority is to invest public dollars equitably. Through a government-wide effort toward that goal, 40% of the overall benefits from federal investments in climate and clean energy flow to disadvantaged communities. 
Similarly, the Inflation Reduction Act includes provisions for clean energy production and infrastructure investments to meet the administration priorities. So with that being said, got a little polling question for you. Should projects that serve distressed or vulnerable communities or populations receive special consideration? I'm gonna wait a second here for your answers. Wow, we've got about 85, 86% saying yes. And so with, with that result of 86% yes, um, could you, somebody, people raise their hands, come off mute and share um, some of those ideas? That'd be great. Maggie, do we have any hands raised? Yes, we're gonna go with uh, Eric Hattelstad. Come off mute, please. Thanks, Eric. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Eric Hattelstad. I'm the Energy Democracy Program Director at CURE in Minnesota. Today, I'm offering comments on behalf of CURE and the Rural Power Coalition. Thank you for holding this listening session and hearing our comments. The Electric Cooperative Program in the in Programs in the Inflation Reduction Act offer our nation's cooperatives a historic opportunity to build rural economies and save rural Americans money through action on the climate crisis. That's why we are disappointed that the public process for these programs is so far set to be extremely brief. Rural communities deserve the opportunity to fully participate in the decisions that will impact their future. The Rural Power Coalition again urges you to follow the Justice 40 implementation process currently laid out by the Department of Energy. Rural electric cooperatives serve 42 million Americans, including 92% of federally recognized persistent poverty counties. Electric cooperatives are also among the most carbon intensive utilities in the United States. This means that programs in the Inflation Reduction Act, like 22004, hold a big opportunity for the United States to make significant impacts in reducing costs for Americans who need it most and reducing emissions in the utilities that need to make the largest reductions. Electric cooperatives have faced many challenges to the clean energy transition that the historic investments in the Inflation Reduction Act will help address. USDA can continue to alleviate the barriers by taking a whole of government approach to implementation of these investments by following these steps. One, dedicating new staff funding provided to the USDA in the IRA to RUS to support implementation. Two, forming partnerships with the Department of Energy to provide technical assistance to potential applicants. And three, forming partnerships with the EPA and using existing frameworks such as global warming potential to measure comparative emissions. Rural electric cooperatives have transformed the economies of rural communities and improved the lives of rural Americans across the country since 1936. Implementation of the Inflation Reduction Act holds the opportunity for rural electric cooperatives to once again improve the lives of millions of, millions of Americans by helping them save money and creating rural jobs. In order to do this, the USDA should prioritize proposals that, one, seek to address underlying finances of cooperatives such as stranded assets that impact member owner energy costs, two, utilize proven technologies that achieve the greatest life cycle reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, three, make renewable energy and energy efficiency investments in the service territory of the cooperative, four, directly support member owners' ability to increase energy efficiency at their home or business, take steps towards beneficial electrification and increase on-site renewable energy generation and storage. And five, projects built in justice for the disadvantaged communities, energy communities or persistent poverty counties. We thank you for the opportunity to share some brief comments with you and look forward to future opportunities for further discussion. Additional comments will be provided in writing. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. And I saw, I was told in the chat box that we've got a couple people asking for the definition of distressed communities and uh, vulnerable populations or communities. We're getting that link to that information in the chat box for you straight away so that you understand where, um, how we build that foundation. So Maggie, are there any more hands raised to talk a little bit about this? Yes. Uh Jim Falk, if you want to come off mute. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm with CURE, and uh, 
I uh, also farm and have a distributed generation on my own uh, property here as a small wind turbine and uh, solar energy. Um, a few years back, uh, back in 2009, uh, our family decided that we wanted to do uh, uh, get involved in wind energy and do a, a larger scale project. So we're actually permitted for a 17.5 megawatt wind farm. Uh, but my point here is getting through the interconnection process, the MISO process, and getting uh, access to the grid has been such a hurdle that um, I just want to point out that you're looking for what we can do to improve uh, the ability to get projects uh, uh, online and, and converting coal to wind or solar. Um, we need to actually have some way to expedite uh, what happens for transmission access. And so even though this is basically around the discussions about co-ops, um, the, they're still going to have to have uh, permitting to get, you know, any changes and alterations. And so this one, this one should be aware of the fact that uh, things can't, you just can't snap your fingers and, and get uh, these projects up without going through the, the regulatory process through, uh, through MISO. And, and, and so we, we actually need to, uh, in my opinion, change the priority levels of how we get uh, renewable energies, uh, to, you know, to move to the top of the list for access on the grid. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Maggie, do we have time for one more hand raised? All right, we're gonna go to Anita Seitz. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. You sure can, thank you, Anita. Thank you. Um, my name is Anita Seitz, and I'm the Advocacy Director for Colorado Communities for Climate Action. We're a coalition of 39 different local governments that have come together for stronger state and federal climate policy. Um, we have very diverse members. 50% um, of our members are Western Slope here in Colorado. Two-thirds of our members are rural. Um, we care about climate issues because as local governments, we disproportionately feel the impacts of the costs of climate change. Um, additionally, equity and environmental justice are key priorities for us and are part of our policy statement. We're very excited about the funding um, coming through the USDA, through the IRA, um, to um, accelerate and act as a catalyst for the clean energy um, transition. We're excited about it being able to, um, to help us retire coal plants, get us on renewable energy, promote um, resilience and distributed generation, um, and support EVs. Um, my, I want to echo earlier comments that were made. I've, there's been some really thoughtful discussion and comments made, um, but many... Um, of our members want to echo the need for applications to be simple, clear, um, for in order for these dollars to be put to their highest and best use. Um, there are capacity issues and a lack of grant writers, and we've seen a lot of that um, sentiment in the chat. So making sure that it's easy for people to fully um, implement um, their clean energy transitions, eliminate bottlenecks, and provide clarity to um, those going after the application will be necessary. Um, additionally, allowing the flexibility so that we can um, have these dollars take away some of the barriers to clean transition. We've heard this earlier today um, as far as stranded assets um, and loan forgiveness or being able to use the dollars to address those barriers will be very important. Um, we also strongly um, encourage these dollars going to disproportionately impacted communities and considering the social cost of carbon. Um, so just want to say thank you for this opportunity um, to provide our comments. These are very high level um, and, you know, appreciate that we have this. And again, would um, echo comments for additional opportunities to provide um, engagement. Thank you, Anita. Val, before we move on to the next question, are there any other um, thoughts or criteria or suggestions in the chat box about how we could serve distressed or vulnerable communities? Um, any ideas like loan forgiveness, set asides, something like that? Are there any other ideas? There sure are. Um, Thank you. We've got some um, suggestions for direct grants with low or no match and set asides. 
Um, we've got some saying pri prioritizing communities with the highest carbon emissions and debt load per capita, and then prioritize investments that maximize savings and benefits to member owners. Um, a comment here with large populations that experience high energy burden, burdens and low slash um, no match grants. Um, make space for companies that have new technologies and enable targeted development. Um, we have another comment that there's a need for potential impact categories like project impact on net GHGs, project impact on local environment, project impact on local community. Um, we've got one that says if a project has a relatively low GHG score and higher community impact should take greater consideration. Um, additional points be provided for those that can positively impact the communities directly or even indirectly. Um, Yes, lots of great comments wow. here. Thank you. Um, yeah, considering the cost of power for consumers, not just in poverty, when determining whether communities distressed, um, just really great suggestions here. So thank you for, for providing those. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to direct your attention to the chat box. There is a link um, to rural development for the um, definition of distressed communities and our vulnerable populations and communities as well. Um, so we're going to move on to the next polling question, but thank hey, you guys. Ruth, yes. I just wanted to, to ask one more question that sure. people have put answers to in the chat. This is Jackie Ponte. Um, <clears throat> Section 22004 does not authorize 100% grants. So there will always be some loan component as we understand it. For those folks who've been, who've been putting in the chat, um, you know, streamline grant, um, and other processes, it would be helpful to know for the loan component in those distressed communities, what type of um, assistance or where the challenges are going to be there uh, around the loan component. Because as Chris noted earlier, uh, Assistant Administrator McLean, we've got to have um, a repayable loan component. So that would be helpful. Chris, am I missing anything there? No, Jackie, I think you're, you're uh, identifying what is a statutory requirement that uh, we're, we'll, where grants are used, it can cover no more than 25% of a project's cost. So that would imply that it'd be 75% uh, of uh, either loan or other, other form of uh, financial support to be able to move a project forward under that provision. Okay. And, and we see some, some chatter in the chat about stacking with other programs. We're exploring on what those stacks might be. Um, taking a page out of Chris McLean's book, we're gonna turn it back on you and say, well, are there programs you'd like to be able to stack it with? And as, as I can state that um, our US is not able to speak for other federal agencies. So, other projects, other programs in other agencies or other benefits uh, may have restrictions of their own. Uh, it, it, it is RUS's reading of the statute that there is nothing in the, these new provisions of the IRA that would uh, prohibit RUS from uh, considering um, other, other act, you know, stacking our, our, our resources with others, but that does not speak to what other agencies or other departments may have as their own requirements and their own statutes. Thank you, Jackie and Chris. And that's a good idea. If you have ideas for what that stack might look like, please put them in the chat box. I think we'd really appreciate that. It would help support some of the other language. So um, share your ideas in the chat box. And so now we'll move on to the next question, but thank you, Jackie, for interjecting that. That's important information. So section 22004 of the act requires that no entity receive more than 10% of total funding being made available. Should Russ consider a ceiling that is lower than the 10% maximum? Yes or no? About a fifth. 55, 46 something split, pretty darn close. Um, Maggie, do we have any hands raised on talking about this? Is um, 
should our U.S., for those that said yes, let's hear from them. Yes. Why should we um, consider that ceiling? That's a, ce a ceiling that is lower than the 10 percent. So we'll go to Stacy Bramendel. Uh -huh. I I'm, I'm afraid I'm referenced. Can you hear me OK? Yes, Stacy. Thank you. Hi there. Hi there. I'm Stacy Brundle. I'm almost afraid to say I'm actually a grant coordinator for a local municipality, a more rural in northern Colorado. Uh, we have our own utilities. Uh, we're moving toward DER as fast as we can. Um, and we have an association with Platte River, uh, which serves four different municipalities up in northern Colorado, Estes, Fort Collins, Loveland, and ourselves. So, but I think I may my question may be out of turn because I'm still relating to the gentleman earlier um, mentioned uh, or the individual earlier mentioned about um, having multiple projects under, um, you know, the funding stream from USDA and from what you would do with, with RUS. And that is very important as I come in as a grant coordinator and trying to coordinate all these different utilities, but looking at it from a standpoint of, you know, we've got to strengthen our grid, we need to harden our good, we need to whatever with some of these initiatives, it's pretty large, major projects from different areas. So we would want to house that under your grant. And then comparing it to the stacking, that's where it's getting a little dicey, I'm seeing as a grant person, seeing that because the agencies as uh, um, uh, he spoke of that we don't necessarily know, you can't speak for another agency and there isn't necessarily some interconnectedness, but housed under the IRA, um, perhaps there might be some more communication between the agencies regarding this, you know, impactful money that's coming through. We've, we've got to think more collaboratively, uh, kind of like a web, but this is an infrastructure thing. This is um, pretty exciting. And I don't have all of the you know, expertise that you do, I can help get them there, but I need to have as many tools as possible. So that's my confusion between the stacking and the, that would be a great conversation for another time, I think. But well, thanks. thank you. Thank you, Stacy. And there has been a lot of conversation between our agencies and I am sure that Chris could concur. There's going to be a lot more communication. So um, Maggie, maybe we could try to find someone that has, um, why they said no to consider a ceiling that is lower than that 10% maximum. We have a hand raise. I'm not sure if it's going to be for this exact question, but okay. we're going to go Thank with you. Foster Hildreth. Yeah. Thank you all for putting on this conversation. I really, we really appreciate it. We're a not-for-profit small cooperative, pretty much in the middle of, of nowhere. I think we're actually closer to Canada and Washington state than we are to the, to the mainland. And it's going to be extremely hard for our membership to pay for this transition to lower carbon. If you looked at the size of our co-op, we're about, we're about 15,500 um, meters. And given the fact that what we're trying to accomplish out here and still embrace carbon reduction projects, uh, you know, we need to, to make sure that we have help and support. Washington State has actually imposed governmental mandates out here with CETA requiring that carbon reduction, which we absolutely support and look forward to it. Um, but if we get closed out because larger GNTs and others have the ability to take, you know, a, a undue burden of funds, then our little tiny co-op and our little tiny community are really going to be pushed out of our ability to make this transition. So um, thanks again for everybody for putting on this listening session. Thank you, Foster. Um, so in the time, consideration of time, we've had so many great comments, we need to move on. And so I am going to um, ask Sherry to take us into the next group of questions. Thank you, Lou. The next set of questions will be unique to section 22004 of the Act. Before we go into those questions, though, I want to say that we will try our best to get to everyone who wants to speak. So if we do not get, get to you today, feel free to put your comments in the chat as we go along. So our next question is a discussion question. Projects funded under the IRA are intended to increase energy efficiency, decrease energy uh, consumption, and increase the deployment and use of renewable energy and or clean energy. 
Knowing this requirement, what metric or metrics are most appropriate to rank applications? measure progress toward meeting the goal of achieving greenhouse gas reductions, and validate the expansion of renewable clean energy. I know that was a very long question, so I'm gonna give you a minute to, to read over it and think about how you'd like to answer that question. We're open to suggestions of your thoughts on what metric or metrics would be most appropriate. So Maggie, do we have any hands raised? Yes, we do. And we're going to go to Hannah Reed. Hannah, you want to come off mute? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you so much. My name is Hannah Reed. I'm from Evergreen Action, a non a nonprofit climate advocacy organization. When dispersing the $9.7 billion available in this program, it's absolutely essential that our U.S. prioritizes uses that will demonstrably reduce carbon emissions above all else in line with the spirit of the IRA and the intent of these funds. Rural co-ops still heavily rely on coal power, which is among the most polluting and expensive energy sources available. While investor-owned utilities have increasingly moved to cleaner and cheaper sources of energy, co-ops are often locked into contracts and financial obligations with coal-fired power generation, and many who want to make the transition lack the financial flexibility to do so. Our U.S. can offer much-needed assistance to these co-ops while helping meet our national goal of reducing carbon pollution, but it's essential that they look at, are these programs going to reduce carbon emissions? They should prioritize the use of these funds to retire coal plants, including through securitization of debt and to replace them with zero emissions, lower cost renewable energy. Thank you so much for your comments. Those were great. So Val, what about any feedback in the chat? Um, we do, yes, we do. Um, we have one comment saying metrics that assess emissions reductions should consider life cycle emissions. For example, replacing coal or gas powered plants with renewable energy don't just reduce emissions from those power plants, but also methane emissions from coal and gas extraction. In contrast, carbon capture projects would exacerbate upstream emissions. Um, we have another comment um, stating, make sure there's a way for utility providers and distributors to partner with companies that are innovating in the space to accelerate the rate of renewable adoption and rate of high efficiency transition. Um, uh, let's see here, we'll go to another one. Comparisons between current fuel type and usage statistics with evidence-based projected proposed fuel type and usage statistics and um, make sure all co-ops know about all clean energy methods. Those should take priority. So we're getting some great, um, great discussion in the chat as well. So thank you for that. That's good, uh, that's good. Maggie, do we have anyone who'd like to speak on their thoughts on what metrics are most appropriate to rank applications and so on? Yeah, we're gonna go to Philip Garcia. Hi, Philip. Hi, uh, my name is Philip Frasica. I'm director of programs at Renew Missouri. We're also a member of the Rural Power Coalition. Uh, we advocate, Renew Missouri advocates for renewable energy and energy efficiency across the state of Missouri. And just wanted to speak to this question and comment that to achieve the greatest reduction in carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide emissions associated with the rural electric systems, USDA should prioritize projects with proven technologies like renewable energy and energy efficiency to achieve the greatest mass reductions of greenhouse gas emissions relative to a benchmark measured in carbon dioxide equivalents over an extended period of time. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Good, good comments. I think we've got time for one more comment on this topic before we move on. If we have anyone with their hand raised to address this topic. Yeah, we're gonna go to Jeremy Fisher. Jeremy. Hi, thank you so much for uh, having us today and having this uh, listening session. Uh, my name is Jeremy Fisher and I'm with uh, Sierra Club. Um, 
you know, this program can be truly transformative if USDA is willing to be transformative and work outside of its traditional boxes. So with respect to this question that you're asking right now, um, the program has to be able to support the utilities that need the most support in reaching clean energy targets. There's a mandate here to be able to reduce greenhouse gas emissions as much as feasible. And that means that USDA needs to focus on those utilities with large carbon footprints and opportunities transition to proven reliable clean energy technologies and permanent carbon reductions. Um, but in addition, and some of the other pieces that you've mentioned earlier, it's really important that those get coupled with harnessing the full potential of this program. I think USDA is gonna to need to be able to accept not only just individual clean energy projects, but as we've heard previously, applications that represent large packages of projects, including portfolios of clean energy, physical infrastructure like storage and transmission, community infrastructure like energy efficiency and electrification, and even balance sheet refinance where utilities face financial barriers. We have to be able to help utilities with stranded assets. Um, third, USDA can really only reach its mandate if it's willing to harness efficiencies and other incentives, including direct pay credits, DOE's investment, energy reinvestment program, um, and other incentives that are offered in the IRA. It must be ready to engage in unconventional forms of portfolio management and finance and really stack those incentives. So thank you so much for moving quickly to establish this program. Thank you for this listening session, and I hope that there will be more uh, going forward. Great comments, Jeremy. Thank you. We're going to move on now to our next discussion question. What is the most effective way to measure comparative reductions in carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide emissions? Think about that for a minute. And Val, if anyone is addressing this question in the chat, we'd be happy to hear, hear about it. Thanks, Sherry. We'll give them just a second here to um, think about it and get some answers typed in. Um, I'm not sure I'm seeing anything directly related to this this um, okay. this ask at this point. So we'll see um, we'll see what we can get here in another minute or so. Okay. Oh, thank you. You know what? What? <laughs> I'm starting to see some now. Oh, good. <laughs> good. <laughs> um, efficiency and resiliency should start in our homes, businesses, and social spaces. Prioritize site-specific investments. Um, evaluation of CO2E relative to a baseline. Um, let's see here. Please use methods and metrics used in states that are already working on this, such as in California. Um, and another comment saying it'll be important to get a good baseline understanding of the emissions intensity of all generation and transmission associations. Um, another comment with measurements of emissions need to take place regularly. Some facilities have measurements taken once or twice a year and report um, on those as their standard. Um, getting some more comments um, discussing that there are models developed by national labs that we could select for all projects to use. Um, preliminary studies on locations, current GHG emissions and develop project that will lower them with a new predicted GHG emission. Establish baselines ASAP for all GHG and pollutants and measures and measure, then keep measuring impacts. So all good ideas here. Thank you for your feedback. Thanks, Val. And I just realized, uh, looked on the screen and realized I had not even, didn't finish that question with the last part of among diverse uh, projects. So I'm glad that, that that slide was on the screen so you all could see the, the rest of the question. Uh, Maggie, do we have any hands raised to, that would like to speak about suggestions for effective ways to measure these reductions? We do not at this time, Sherry. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Give you another second or two in case you have ideas that uh, come to you. And then we'll move on to our next discussion question. But of course, you all know we've said it several times. If things co come to you as we are um, uh, asking these other questions, if you think about something else, 
feel, feel free to add that to the chat so we'll, we'll keep a record. So our next discussion question as we move on is as consumer owned entities, how can cooperatives ensure that savings resulting from the program contribute to section 22004 statutory purpose of affordability? And we'll give you a couple of minutes to think about that. Maybe think about other programs you've worked with. Are there ways to allow for savings to enhance affordability? Do we have anything coming in the chat, Val? Uh, yeah, we do have one comment. Um, performance guarantees should be part of the application process and verified during the construction process. Great, great. Maybe that'll spur another thought. Yeah, we've had some, some great um, feedback provided today. And again, we do just want to thank you for that. So please, if you have any ideas, um, please post it in the chat box. You can always... Um, publicly comment on the regulations.gov site. Um, we are seeing some more ideas come in too. Um, one idea is to move our consumers from using propane to using cleaner, more affordable electric energy. Um, we have a comment saying this goal is given for cooperatives as everything passes down to our member owners. Um, the ability to measure reductions throughout the project span to see whether expected reductions occur should be careful in how that impacts util utilities down the line. Uh, need good data, but that data needs to be de-risked for the utils if things aren't panning out. And understanding of why and help should be more important than this applicant's project didn't come through. So, Wow, these are great. Great US, comments. We have another one saying USDA could consider the broader rate payer savings opportunities of electrifying transportation and heating systems that currently rely on fossil fuels. On previous questions on how, oh, we've got one going back to how to measure. Um, here's one, cooperatives can ensure that savings resulting from this program contribute to affordability by prioritizing applications that include local investments in renewable energy and energy efficiency programs with proven track records, such as community solar and pays slash on-bill tariff inclusive financing programs to increase member-owned bill affordability. Wow, that is that is some great, great feedback. And we appreciate it so much. This is going to give us so much great information as, as our leadership moves forward on how to um, get applications and just move this project forward. So do we have uh, anything else? It's my understanding we don't have any hands raised at this point. And before, oh yeah, Val? Excuse me, there are quite a few um, comments coming in oh, um, on prioritizing. So thank you for all of those. Um, we can either read them or we can move on if we have more questions. But um, we do have some excellent uh, feedback provided here for our leadership today. Thank you. Thank you, Val. Uh, before we move on from this topic, is there anything else um, that, that we need to, uh, any answers, any thoughts that, that you guys may have? So we do have one hand raised. We're gonna okay. go to Emily Piantech. Sorry if I butchered that name. Hi, no worries, can you hear me? Yes, thanks Emily. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Emily Piantech. I'm a Virginia State Policy Advocate with the nonprofit organization Appalachian Voices. Um, and I would like to comment on this question, particularly because it applies to a generation and transmission electric cooperative in Virginia, Old Dominion Electric Cooperative, which serves um, many of our 13 other electric co-ops. Um, and in regards to this question about affordability, Old Dominion Electric Cooperative, or ODEC, owns 50% of a coal-fired power plant called the Clover Plant in Clover, Virginia. Um, and an investor-owned utility, Dominion Energy, owns the other half. 
but has indicated an intention to retire its half of the clover plant um, within the next several years for good reason. In 2021, the clover plant barely operated, meeting an average 12% capacity factor as cheaper resources in the PJM market beat the cost for coal. Unfortunately, though, ODEC, which is the Generation and Transmission Cooperative, still has $300 million invested in the clover plant. And this presents both a significant cost burden to co-op customers in Virginia, whose, whose utilities rely on ODEC for their power supply, um, as well as a substantial negative impact on our ability to meet national carbon reduction goals. Um, we are hopeful that ODEC, which now has the opportunity to apply to this new grant program from USDA, um, would be able to use that money to transition from its reliance on fossil fuels, and that would reduce both risks and cost to co-op members over time of stranded assets like the clover plant. But we're worried that ODEC might pursue carbon capture at the clover plant with funds from section 2020 or 22004 rather than investing in proven and less risky renewable resources. So just um, my comment is that in distributing these grant funds, USDA should prioritize funding proven renewable energy technologies that do achieve the greatest life cycle reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, um, because those will also help reduce costs as well. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm thrilled that USDA has the ability to help advance rural economic development and help impacted communities make the transition um, to clean energy. Thank you. Thank you, Emily, for those great comments. Very well said. And Maggie, uh, do we have any hands raised before we move on? Yeah, we're gonna go to Ty Gorman. Ty, if you wanna come off mute. Uh, yes, thank you for this listening session. I'm Ty Gorman, the Sierra Club in Kansas. Um, and just wanted to agree with the other commenters here and say that we can contribute to affordability by prioritizing the applications that retire the expensive coal plants. Uh, here in Kansas, we have Sunflower Electric Cooperative, serves 76,000 members with an expensive 40-year-old coal plant and gas, despite the fact that Sunflower lies in one of the richest wind and solar lanes in the Midwest. Uh, sunflowers served by less than 14% wind and barely enough solar to, to register. Despite, so it's, you know, despite these great opportunities here for local cheap renewables and providing local jobs, our member-owned cooperatives have struggled to build renewable energy because uh, largely I've had access or policy background or capacity to use incentives um, and to keep prices low for customers. So USDA's new granting authority is key to that transition for them and can allow them to uh, to uh, create owners and beneficiaries of the rural customers in the co-ops and uh, bring these low-cost, resilient, clean energy uh, to their backyards. So I just hope that USDA will be ready to reach out to my cooperatives, uh, help them navigate development of the best applications that support affordability uh, and proven clean energy technologies like the wind, solar, storage, and geothermal. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ty. And I know we've said it more than once, you all have provided such good feedback and we appreciate you taking your time on a Friday afternoon to join us and to uh, provide this great feedback because I know that um, Friday afternoons are not always best. And so we, we know that you all are committed to this project and we appreciate your feedback. So now I'm gonna turn it to Lou to, um, to wrap us up. Thank you, Sherry. And um, just a special thank you out to everyone for being here today. Like Sherry said, it's a Friday afternoon, but um, we really appreciate sincerely the time that you're given to be here and the time that you've taken to prepare your comments. They're so comprehensive and inclusive. Um, just thank you so much. Um, it's really gonna help our leadership implement the implement Inflation Reduction Act um, to the best to serve the needs of our rural America. So thank you so much. Um, and as we start closing today, just remember that you can still put your comments in the chat box. We've given you that link to the Federal Register, but well, that's gonna be open till November 28th. So please put your comments there as well. We sincerely mean it when we say we wanna hear from you that we're listening. And so I'm gonna ask Chris McLean to, um, Give us a call to action and take us out today. Thank you. All right, thank you, Lou, and thank you, Sherry. And just uh, thank you all of our uh, participating and listening audience out there. 
I, I hope you enjoyed this uh, unique forum. Um, we could have just opened a, a, a Federal Register comment period and taken written comments, but I think there's something um, really special about the dialogue that we've had these last two days where we get to hear uh, real people express uh, real views. And what is also exciting is to see in the chat box, the dialogue going among, on, among the members. So I want to tell you uh, a deep appreciation because frankly, I've learned a lot myself. Um, you know, this has just been an absolute joy to share this historic and exciting um, uh, opportunity in the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, it, just, it is hard to overstate uh, the consequence and impact of that legislation um, in the world of rural electrification taken as a whole, not only our provisions, but those tax provisions and provisions that the Department of Energy have, as well as Department of Energy provisions and the um, bipartisan infrastructure bill. So as Lou mentioned, um, we, we understand that, that uh, the uh, organizing of this uh, listening session maybe came upon um, you folks quickly, but we do have the comment period open till the 28th. So there's going to be plenty of time to be able to submit um, comments. I was especially interested to see uh, the uh, polling question where uh, folks were uh, expressing their knowledge of the RUS uh, application process, et cetera. And so um, while we talked about uh, just section 22004 today and, and the amazing uh, resources that that legislation brings forward, I want to invite each and every one of you to um, learn more about RUS. Come to our website. Uh, we have uh, an infrastructure loan program dating back to 1935. Uh, we have uh, an amazing zero interest rate um, rural energy savings program to uh, relend to uh, consumers at interest rates of no higher than 5% for energy efficiency measures. And uh, we are working uh, on, uh, as we await, uh, Full year appropriations, we're working on a notice for our very, very small, but um, um, uh, important to the folks who are served by it, high energy cost grant uh, program. And just this week, uh, the agency closed its latest round of funding for uh, broadband infrastructure in the ReConnect program, and uh, we'll be evaluating uh, another historic level set of uh, applications. RUS also finances uh, water and sewer improvements in rural areas. And our sister agency who participated with us yesterday, Rural Business Cooperative Service, has a program that uh, rural electric cooperatives use so well to build their communities called the Rural Economic Development Loan and Grant Program, otherwise called the Red Leg. So please take an opportunity as you learn more about the IRA and uh, provide us additional guidance and comments um, to learn more about the other programs that we have that will be running simultaneously uh, with our work um, uh, to implement IRA. Uh, as uh, Lou and Sherry mentioned, today's proceedings and yesterday's proceedings are uh, being recorded or have been recorded. And so uh, once they get processed and ready to go, they will be up on our website for anyone who missed it or if you'd like to review things. Let me leave you with uh, a couple of big tips um, before we sign off. The federal government has a program called, or has a um, requirement uh, called SAMS registration. SAM stands for System for Awards Management. Uh, it is nearly universal across uh, federal grants programs. Uh, I want to encourage everybody, um, even if you have even the smallest thought of applying for uh, any of the programs we've talked about today to please, one, check your SAMS registration if you have one already to make sure it is current. It has to be renewed on a, on a revolving basis. Uh, or two, if you are not in the SAM system, please register because uh, the, these programs will require SAMS registration. And I will say with so much infrastructure investment in the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, the CHIPS Act, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, there is a big traffic jam in the SAMS registration queue. So please uh, make sure that you uh, uh, get ahead of the game and be prepared 
for whatever opportunities arise um, uh, in the near future. So uh, please take a look at SANS. There was also a little question or comment about um, uh, projects that were either under construction already. Uh, our rural development agencies are uh, bound by the National Environmental Policy Act, the uh, Endangered Species Act, as well as the uh, Historic Preservation Act. And so our, our rule uh, that applies across our US and RD programs in general is that um, projects have to clear their environmental review before uh, funds can be released. So uh, if a project is already underway, that is uh, likely uh, going to be uh, an impediment to apply for something new. However, an enhancement to an existing project, I saw heard mention of a, of a solar project that has already been built. Um, uh, it is uh, possible either under 22001 or possibly 22004 to uh, apply for an enhancement that would expand um, the capability of an existing investment. And, and uh, we will be uh, looking at those items. But uh, one of the biggest things I, I've, I've seen is that uh, there's been a, a, a challenge for applicants is jumping the gun on construction um, before environmental review has been cleared. So please bear that in mind. Um, that is a, an overarching uh, requirement. But what an amazing uh, two afternoons uh, to spend on an amazing piece of legislation. Thank you for your excellent participation. Uh, you have really uh, put some good thoughts forward. We will, we will dig in deeply to um, all of your comments, written, oral, chat posted, uh, poll posted, and otherwise. And on behalf of the Rural Utility Service, uh, Rural Development, Rural Development's Innovation Center, uh, our, and our leadership, as well as all of our uh, federal family uh, partners who have been listening with us, thank you for an excellent um, session. And uh, please feel free to provide any additional comments that uh, you see appropriate. Or if you have colleagues that were not able to make today's event, again, you, they can take a listen to the listening session, as well as provide comments uh, through uh, the 28th of this month. So thank you. Appreciate all of your participation. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Bye-bye.